All right, moving on to the last film in this. Well, not technically. There's there is another film in this franchise, so maybe I'll get to it eventually. But for right now, we're gonna finish it up with uh, the Woman in Black Two, Angel of Death. Angel of Death. She never left. So says the sub or the uh, tagline. All right. So <clears throat> this has a good setting. I really like the setting of this movie. This movie is kind of shit upon. And while I can kind of understand that because the film does feel kind of meandering and a little slow at times, so does the first film. And aesthetically, this film matches tonally. Um, and it features just the same amount of kid death as the first one. Well, I guess the three girls jumping out the window counts as three kids. Um, but death sequences, how about we go with that? Um, and I think the continuity is actually pretty good. The house, the, uh, you know, the marsh, the road, the area where... The only, the only real difference here is that it's all water where the carriage went in. And it's not sludge or mud or whatever the hell when, when Radcliffe goes in there. Um, so that's like one thing that's off. But everything else looks really good. And this is set like 30 or 40 years. I think it's about 30 years. 30 years. Because this is uh, the first film... Uh, primarily takes place in 1910. This is like 19... I want to say this is 1940 because the opening of this movie starts with the London Blitz uh, during World War II. Um, so, yeah, that that happened in 40. My dad's really into World War II stuff, so I've watched it. I know a lot about World War II. Um, <laughs> it's just, yeah, I've watched a lot of shit on World War II. Anyway, um, but I'm no expert by any means. So whatever I say, take with a fucking huge grain of salt. I'm just going off of pure memory. Um, anyway, so, but I love the concept behind this. That there is basically a makeshift orphanage being set up for the school kids and their teacher and their headmistress. And they're going to go and they're going to stay at the woman in black's residence, you know. Here's a bunch of children staying in a child murderer's house. Like, this is perfect. This is a fantastic setup. This actually kind of reminds me of Annabelle creation. Um, and I, I liked this movie. I thought it was fine. I mean, it's not as good as the first one. I think it is a downgrade. I do find it to be boring at times, but... You know, I liked the I liked the tonal and aesthetical continuity. I liked um, the set continuity. I liked that kind of stuff. I liked the concept. I liked the time period setting. I liked what drew them there. How they kind of have no choice but to stay. I liked the girl's commitment to her uh, her to her children because she lost her child when she was really young and, and gave birth and they took her child away from her, which she constantly kind of has nightmares about, reoccurring nightmares. So now she kind of finds it to be her duty to protect these children. And then she becomes very protective over the kid named Edward, who is a mute child ever since the death of his parents. And her and the woman in black are basically fighting for this child to be their child now like she's kind of taking him under her wing as her you know stand-in son as is the woman in black or janelle or janelle janette 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 um so yeah you've you've got eve and janette kind of fighting over this kid because they both lost their children and they can almost relate to one another but of course they don't because one is evil <laughs> and one is not um so i do like the parallels there once again she lost her son, you know, and so did uh, Jeanette. So that I think that's cool. I think that matches the first one with the with that parallel and and with all as I said the uh, continuity there. So good stuff. I did find it funny that Eve's last name is uh, Parkins, so she's Miss Parkins. So if she is fi if she did have a son, and he's you know that that she lost, um, she uh, she. <laughs> That kid would be Mrs. Parkinson's. Mrs. Parkinson. 
I just thought that was really funny when they said her name was Parkins. And then they were talking about her son. And I was like, Parkins' son? <laughs> that was kind of fucking funny to me. Um, anyway, so when they get to this house, the headmistress, I think is who it is, she's talking about how the accommodations that they've been gifted during this wartime, after their whole town has been bombed, is just not up to the caliber that she thinks that they should have. It's like, you fucking kidding me. Are you fucking kidding me right now? <laughs> like, you should be thankful you're alive. You should be thankful that you have any housing. So, spare me. But this kind of reminds me of, like, Rose's mom in Titanic, where she's, like, getting on the lifeboat. And she's like, well, I do hope they're not too crowded. And she's like, shut up, mom. I love it. Hey, you know, she's such a bitch. And this reminds me of that. Like, oh, I'm sorry. Is this place not posh enough for you? Were you expecting, like, valet service at the door? And, you know, people tending and waiting on you hand and foot when you walk through, rolling out the fucking red carpet? Um... So yeah, I, I don't think that this film is the failure everybody thinks that it is. I think that it is an adequate sequel. I've already mentioned all the things, I'm not going to reiterate. But from the things I said, I find this to be a fairly successful successor. I, I don't know. I Like, yes, I get it. It's not the most intriguing and entertaining watch. But if I take it as a sequel and I, you know, judge it on its merits being a sequel to this first film that I quite enjoy, I think it does a pretty good job. It's just that it does feel, I don't know, I guess it's as climatic as the first and it ends very similarly. Maybe that's the problem people have is that it's, a little a tad too redundant but I don't find that to be true here I find that this is the next logical step in this storyline that kids would come to this house and they would suffer for it and to set this during World War two and I don't know I think that's a pretty cool idea and I like the concept and whatnot behind it now the guy who wrote this I want to say it was wrote or directed I can't remember who it was, but he did some writing, some additional material work on Paddington 2, which all you guys know, I fucking think is a straight up bona fide masterpiece of cinema. Um, so when I saw he was involved in any capacity in Paddington 2, my respect for this person went up drastically. So yes, here I am on a horror channel blowing a kid's movie again, which I will continue to do for years to come because Paddington 2 is fucking mesmerizing it's phenomenal okay well can i say it enough anyway as is paddington one just so you know they're both fantastic but paddington two is this you know the better of the two and hopefully part three which has been announced will be even better i don't know how that's possible but i am willing to find out um and okay so in this movie we get multiple deaths of children as well the first child dying is a bully that is picking on edward he is found tangled up in some barbed wire outside and you know it's kind of blamed on eve because she supposedly left the door open even though she did not um this obviously was the woman in black but uh this kid gets out and he tang you know, he, he tangles himself up in, in barbed wire and, and dies. And then there is um another kid who uh tries to suffocate herself with a gas mask and is eventually successful in doing so. Um so that that's pretty that's pretty messed up right there. Um uh, but their deaths aren't as I guess the kid laying next to the barbed wire all dead like that does it is kind of fucked up. Now, who the kid is in the dummy airplane is that I can't remember. Was that supposed to be a vision of dead Edward or was that a vision of dead Nathaniel or I don't know. I didn't get that one. And we we see him for such a short moment. Maybe they say the name and I just completely missed it. I mean, the film does drag a tad so i was kind of checking in and out um 
I was actually texting with Ariel, who was the one who brought this to my attention as a review, and I told her I'd do both for her. Um, so we were kind of chatting back and forth during this movie, but I was paying pretty good attention, as you can tell. I got most of it. Uh, there is a romantic entanglement going on here between Eve and Harry, um, which I would assume, this just came to me right in this moment, that Harry is probably a nod to Daniel Radcliffe since he played Harry Potter. Hmm. I wonder. I wonder. But yeah, Harry. Uh, so there's some romance there going on. And I think it's, you know, at first I was thinking, eh, is this warranted? Is this necessary? You know, I quite like it. I, I think about it like... She confides in him, telling him her dark secret, which is that she lost her son uh, at the birth of of him. And so she confides in him that information. And then he confides in her that he was the lone survivor of a plane crash and has now been labeled a coward and is not allowed to fly anymore in the Air Force. So this is, uh, you know, his disgrace and he sees himself as a coward. And um, in doing so, of, of revealing these things to one another, they start to care for one another and they have a romantic moment. And he uh, you know, gets over his cowardice um, and uh, f jumps into the water to save them both and in doing so is pulled down under and dies. So he dies the hero after thinking he is a uh, coward and she uh, also faces her fears and fights back for the son she never has. So she's kind of fighting against her demons to rectify something with her son, and he's fighting against his demons to prove he's not the coward, and he will save people when it, you know, is uh, when the opportunity presents itself. We'll say. Um, and then we think that we think that uh, Edward gets blown up, but. He ends up not getting blown up. I'm not really honestly sure how that's possible. Uh, when she, when Eve is stuck in the house, she can't get through any of the doors. She sees Edwards going for the marshes. She wants to get out of there. So she sees that she can't get out. So what does she do? She's a badass. She does something that I'm constantly always being like, why don't people do this more often in these kinds of movies? She just burrows her ass right through the floor falls straight down to the next floor and goes right out the house. Now, why the woman in black wouldn't just lock all the doors in that room? Who fucking knows? Don't care. The chick was cool enough to go through the floor of the house to get to the next room so that she can get out and save this kid. So, that's pretty damn cool on her. Um, <clears throat> and then they, once this is all wrapped up, Eve tells Edward that she thinks that... Uh, Harry is keeping the woman in black at bay, but then she reminds us with some cheap jump scare at the end of the movie that she breaks his face, his likeness, his photograph uh, right at the end of the movie saying, bitch, this guy got control over nothing. So I thought it was, you know, poetic that she uh, cracked his picture since we are led to believe he's the protector of of them and it, and is keeping her away so it is what it is i just the whole scream face in the fucking camera thing right before the credits roll is the cheapest shit in horror even films i love like unfriended ariel unfriended which is amazing which is amazing um she claims that she thinks unfriended dark web is far superior so I'll attack her in the comments below on how wrong she is. <laughs> She's entitled to her opinion. I don't really care. If she thinks that, that's awesome. I'm glad you liked one of them at least. Um, all right, so let's see. The rocking chair returns. I thought that was cool little connection as well, continuity, because in the first movie, this rocking chair becomes, you know, part of it. And then this is what we find out she used to hang herself, or at least that's how I saw it pretty sure that's accurate uh so this is like a tool of her demise and the rocking signifies the last thing she would have heard as she was suffocating to death from her own hanging so uh i like that the chair is kind of tied to her 
because of her interaction with it in you know, her last moment. So pretty cool. And if that isn't accurate, if for some reason I saw that wrong in the first movie, that's what it fucking should be. And I just wrote it better than it is. But I'm almost 100% that's accurate. Um, and we do get confirmation that in this movie that if she can't see you, or if you can't see her, you can't die by her. Now someone else, maybe she could influence to kill you. So I guess there is a workaround there. But uh, someone is blind and they can't be influenced by her in this. So there you go. Um, and then... Um, yeah, I think that's it. I mean, I don't really have a lot more to say about it. The film is, yeah, I've said enough. I've said enough. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say anything. So there you are, Ariel. Two film reviews in a row for you. So get off my back about Fade to Black. Maybe one day I'll get to it, but this one, this, these two will suffice. And um, anyways, so adios.